Welcome one and all to the Cool Words Podcast with me, your host, as always, David Kipping. This week, it is my pleasure to be joined by a friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Sutter. Paul is a pretty interesting guy. He started a career as a research scientist, but then sort of transitioned into a full-time science communicator. And he's probably a familiar face to many of you. He has appeared on many TV shows talking about space and astronomy. Probably one of my favorites is How the Universe Works. I bet it's something that some of you have seen. He does a fantastic job on there. So his face will probably look familiar to you if you're watching this on YouTube. And I think he's been on like sort of five or six of those seasons. He's also done a whole bunch of interviews on CNN and many of the TV shows. So he's probably a familiar face and he's a very skillful science communicator. So I was glad to have him on. So why do I want to bring Paul on? Paul has written this really interesting book, a very challenging book. He's written two previous books, which were more kind of the popular science type stuff, the kind of stuff about how, how do you die in space was one of his previous books. But, the, you know, his new book is about rescuing science and really the challenge of how trust in science from the public has been declining over recent years. This was a book that he told me before we got started chatting. He was inspired to write this during the pandemic. So during lockdown, he was watching the news like many of us read the newspaper and he was seeing, he was seeing and hearing from people interacting with him how much the the trust in science was declining. And I think we all felt that there was a lot of skepticism about vaccines. And I think that has actually spread into many of the fields of science as well. So obviously something as a scientist, I've been worried about many scientists have been worried about. Paul has taken the step of trying to address this huge and challenging topic. And we had a fantastic conversation this podcast. I definitely pushed him into several areas which were difficult, I think, for both of us to talk about. But these are the conversations that we have to have. We came up, I think, with some ideas and some answers. But at the same time, I think this is just the start of a conversation that not just scientists need to have, but we need to have with the public directly. So we really do want to actually hear from the public. If you're interested in this, please do write to me or to if you're on YouTube, you can put in the comments. We would love to hear your thoughts about this big problem of why is it that science is losing trust amongst the public and what can we do as scientists, what can the scientific community do to address that and how much of it, quite frankly, is on the is on the shoulders, is it the fault of not just science communicators but scientists themselves, those actually doing the research, even malpractice, which can happen in science. And that's not an easy thing to discuss and so we get into some big topics in this one. I'm going to let Paul explain to you all about his book and we'll get into some of that meaty, juicy gossip in the in this podcast. So please enjoy. Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. You know, me and you, we've been chatting a lot over the last few years about science communication and how important it is to discuss our results in a scientific context to the community, to the broader public. And of course, you are prolific in terms of talking to the, to the public about this. And you've written three books so far, and your third book is just coming out. So this is Rescuing Science, Restoring Trust in an Age of Doubt. And this follows How to Die in Space and Your Place in the Universe, which were kind of different books. So this book, yeah, it feels a bit different. Um, tell us, tell me a little bit about this book. Absolutely. This was definitely a very different book for me. This was an excursion from what I usually write about, which is popular science, you know, stars blowing up, fate of the universe. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I normally read, uh, write about, talk about, speak about. Kind of pops that kind of stuff, right? Exactly. That pops off the shelf pretty easily. Exactly. Yeah. And this book it was a passion project and is a passion project. I hope it sells well, but it is not my expectation for it to sell the same as my previous two books. This this book was uh, much more personal, much more raw, much more heartbreaking, actually, to write, mm. difficult to write. Um, I joke in the introduction to this book that this book was harder to write than writing about quantum mechanics. Mm. Uh, because it's about an institution that I love, which is science. 
I love being a scientist. I love looking at the world through a scientific lens. I think it's a powerful philosophy for approaching inquiries into the natural world. But I wrote this in the summer of 2020 at the height of the pandemic, mm. during the lockdowns, before the vaccine. And I was watching people fall out of love with science before my very eyes. And people start to violently hate science and what science represents. And I felt compelled to write this book. Like any book, you know, I, you have a you have a feeling, you have a thought, you have a compulsion. You just mm -hmm. have to put your words to paper. And so I did. I did it without a contract, without an agent, without a publisher. I mm -hmm. just wrote it. It took nearly four years to get it into print. Um, it was a very difficult journey. Uh, went through three different publishers before one finally you know most books mm. are rejected by most publishers that's not anything special that's normal yeah uh, but what is unique is to actually have a contract and then the publisher pull out mm. and that happened twice wow so you said it was hard obviously from the from the getting a publisher on board with what i guess is somewhat of a controversial hot yeah. topic in society of the trust in science but you said it was also difficult on a personal level to write this book why was that right because what I realized is that our approach, and I'm speaking very, very broadly, there are, mm. of course, exceptions. Our approach as scientists, when we're met with anti-science or we're met with declining trust, our natural reaction is combat, mm -hmm. ridicule, make fun of those those morons who don't know any better. Oh, they don't even know the earth revolves around the sun uh, or or how long a year is. It's it's a year long. Um, <laughs> it's easy to make fun of the other. It's easy to make fun of the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's easy to dehumanize them. Yeah. And it's easy to place the blame of declining trust in science on malicious actors or idiots or you know just anything but us and what i realized is that we ourselves as scientists are making science a less trustworthy institution that we are in fact reaping what we have sowed over mm. the past two generations and that we've taken this assumption of public trust and public goodwill and public funding and just assumed it would last forever and then we could do whatever we want with mm. it and now i believe we are facing some very very hard realities and so this book as i started writing it i was drawing from personal experiences about how i believe that that scientists are not handling themselves correctly or healthily in regards to the public or in regards to each other or in regards to how they treat junior scientists at first i thought it was just me and so it was a very personal book but then i started reading Mm -hmm. more and more and more and more the book has something like 250 citations in it because it turns out nothing i thought nothing i felt nothing i wrote was i, I was alone in that that there are data there are statistics there are surveys to show some of these dysfunctions and we can get into what they are yeah. and that this is causing people to increasingly miss mistrust science right so there is i think i agree with you that um f just from a intuitional sense there is a sense since i've been doing you know, my phd was probably uh, like 15 years ago or something and i think even that time i felt talking to the public there is a difference in the reactions and obviously on the YouTube comments of my videos, and there's like, you, <laughs> oh, I, YouTube comments. I mean, when the aliens, when we make first contact, the first thing we are hiding from them are the YouTube, the YouTube comments. comments right. so we do not. That is not it's the not, side of humanity. We're going to show them like great composers and works of art. The YouTube comments are in the back. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I will say in defense, there are some good <laughs> Absolutely. people out yes, there yes. who th write thoughtful comments, but there's also a lot of trash. But. I have seen even amongst the you know the statistics of that there there has been some trends happening and it's a bit worrying, but um, 
that's just more anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you could give us a, like a solid example. What is a case study, if you like, of uh, something where the public has clearly been losing trust, a scientific topic or um, a piece of technology or something, something where people have been losing trust over time and what's the evidence to support that? Absolutely. So uh, what I draw from a lot in my book is uh, some Pew Research surveys that have been going on for decades. So you can watch very long-term trends in public attitudes towards science. Mm -hmm. You know, They run this survey once or twice a year. The latest one was in October of 2023. And they ask broad questions, but then also very specific questions. And you can ask, like, what are you most especially worried about? People now are very worried about AI. They're worried about AI taking their jobs. They are worried about uh, genetic manipulation. Mm -hmm. They are worried about out of control, accelerated technological advancement. And where do we get our technology? We get it from our scientific inquiry into the universe. The more we learn about the universe, the more powerful technology we can create. People are worried about the impacts of that technology because oftentimes their livelihoods, their careers, their ability to make money for their family are on the line. Mm. They are at risk. And they are naturally very worried about subjects like that. They are worried about climate change. Uh, they are worried about the spread of infectious diseases. They are worried about the security of the food supply. They are worried about erosion and pollution. Um, they, they are worried about a million things that science touches. Mm. And so is this this is a trend that we're seeing in uh, you, you mentioned that the pandemic was obviously kind of a turning point and we'll definitely come back to that point. But if you look at historical trends, has there been um, you know has there been ebbs and flows in public trust? Is it like a, a wave that goes up and down or one might imagine that maybe the Apollo era or something was kind of the pinnacle of <laughs> trust in science when we had you know the space age being born in the US yeah. and, and beyond. Has there been a steady decline or does it go in ups and downs? Uh, absolutely. It's very nuanced, as you might imagine. And of course, we need to grade on a curve because it used to be that we would burn scientists at the stake. So we're not doing that anymore. Mm. And so in that sense, uh, we've come a long way in our treatment of scientists. But for sure especially after World War II during the explosion of the space race and the development and explosion of vaccines and uh, not genetic, genetically modified food, but, but selective strains of food to increase crop yields, the development of pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers that could you know, lift billions of people out of poverty. You know, science was a superhero in the mm. mid to late 20th century, the, the, the trust in science, belief in science, positive attitudes towards science were at an all time high. And they have been steadily declining since roughly the 90s. There have been ebbs and flows, but those ebbs and flows are on top of a general decline. That's kind of depressing. Um, but it certainly, it certainly matches up with, yeah, what we say about our own kind of intuition about what's happening in society. Now, if we um, take a specific area, I'm wondering if there's a specific topic that you think has received the most gratuitous distrust in science. And in that specific topic, you mentioned that you thought some of the blame, which is against the traditional narrative, that mm -hmm. it's, it's nothing, we're not to blame, <laughs> but that the scientists might be to blame. But is that and I think you were kind of implying it was from the science communication aspect, but is there any area of science that has been particularly focused on as a distrust area where it's also perhaps you think there's bad science happening and that has also fermented a, a distrust that maybe we shouldn't be so easy to, you know, like we said, like the public is, you know, it's all the public's fault. They just don't <laughs> understand, but maybe there are cases where that criticism is fair. Do you think there are instances like that? Or do you think it's always this communication that's the problem? Oh, there, there are so many examples we can turn to. And all of these examples have their own root causes, but we can look at the examples first. One is when scientists are bought and paid for and are willing to leverage their expertise to lie. 
an easy example of that is the health effects of cigarette smoking. Mm. So now we know cigarette smoking is kind of bad for you. It gives you lung cancer and all sorts of horrible uh, uh, outcomes, and you shouldn't do it. There are people alive right now that remember a time when scientists who knew the evidence, now we looking, looking back, we know the evidence was already being accumulated in the 50s and 60s that pointed to a strong statistical link between smoking and lung cancer, but were willing to put their names on falsified studies, press releases, reports, were willing to sell their PhD to lie to say smoking is just fine. Mm-hmm. People remember that and people don't forget that. Mm. So that when we come around and say, by the way, now you should alter your behavior this way, they say, well, you've lied before. How do we know you're not lying right now? That's a difficult question to answer. Not an impossible question to answer, but a very difficult, very uncomfortable question to answer. Mm. Another example is, is pharmaceutical research. When we came out with the vaccine and we said, hey, take this vaccine, it will save your life. People said, well, pharmaceutical, giant pharmaceutical companies, you've lied to us before where either you exaggerated the benefits of a medicine or you hid the side effects or you 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 did a study and you said it was safe and then 5 years later it turns out we're giving birth birth defects to our kids mm-hmm. you've lied to us before you've gotten it wrong before how do we know you're right how do you know that there are no long term side effects from this vaccine That's not an impossible question to answer, but it's a very difficult, very uncomfortable question to answer. So there are cases where scientists have outright lied. There are are cases of scientists when they've gone beyond the basis of the evidence Mm -hmm. to push for a particular policy decision. Uh, And then there are cases where there's just awful science, just poorly done research, poorly controlled you know egg are eggs good for you or bad for you part of the problem is that's actually a difficult question to answer and part of it is like so there's it's easy to generate papers that are just meaningless just statistical noise and don't actually contain any useful information Mm. uh we can even point to examples in physics and astronomy like there were big splashy results about say neutrinos travel faster than light Actually, a cable in the back of the machine wasn't plugged in all the way. But man, those headlines were all out there. And you can't just blame the media, which is very tempting, uh, because for every news story that's out there about science, there is a science journal article. There are scientists who are willing to provide quotes, who are willing to engage with the media and, and, and push wrong ideas, bad ideas, fraudulent ideas. And then if I can't blame the public, who don't know the Mm. ins and outs of science. There's no reason for them to, because they're not trained scientists um, to distinguish the good from the bad, from the ugly. You know, with the neutrino thing, just to come back to that for a second, because that is, that's an example that we talk about in class often, Mm -hmm. like it's a famous example, but um, I thought it was the case in that, that there was no publication at the time. It was just sort of a, this new story emerged. And I think the experiment had happened, but I remember hearing from, uh, quotes from these scientists who were much more skeptical about it and they at least the ones i read and they were like look this is almost certainly a wire that's been yeah. placed <laughs> in the wrong thing and so i kind of liked that one because the scientists themselves were like it felt like many of them involved were trying to quell that story and trying to shoot it down but you know it's a story that's so big it kind of takes on a a beast of its own it yep. becomes its own thing which was which was hard to handle but I definitely hear you more generally. And, you know, I think we ever told you this before, uh, you know, we, we often have lunch together and talk about our various science communication stories. But, um, you know, my dad uh, was actually very distrusting of science growing up. And um, he, used to, he used to read the Daily Mail newspaper mm-hmm. and he was a Christian and, you know, I grew up in that world. And so he, uh, he would often say to me, like, you know, I just don't trust science because I will read one day in the newspaper that tomatoes are good for you. And then the <laughs> next month, it'll say the exact yep. opposite thing. And that was his filter of science. Huh? And he, 
you know, he he labeled, and and there's so much wrong with that because there's, <laughs> there's the fact that you're, you know, the the outlet you're reading it, that you're reading it in a newspaper, let alone what type of yeah. newspaper it is, but just you're reading it in a newspaper that isn't the study that's gone through some kind of filter yes. to get to that point. And then, of course, that's probably not even what the study even said. The, the study probably said something like it is beneficial to this particular yeah. uh, pathway or something in your body. It's not like overall this is good for you. Yeah. But then it gets translated. And so uh, there are people who say, look, because of this specific example, therefore, ergo, all science is bad. Yep. And that feels very unfair. And it's like saying there's one bad athlete you know let's say you you, you, know, you love watching baseball or something mm -hmm. and there's one baseball player who trust you know tests negative for, for drugs therefore all of them are, are corrupt and it's i get why people uh, you know want to make that that generalization yeah. but it's really depressing as a scientist when <laughs> someone says that to you it is it's depressing and discouraging you're right it's unfair but life is under no obligation to be fair um this is the reality most people interact with science through journalism, through headlines, through newspapers, through blogs and online articles. That is how most people interface and interact and experience science. That is the reality that has been the reality for half a century. So my question is, why aren't scientists, you know, getting mandatory media training? Mm -hmm. Why don't why aren't we learning how to interact and communicate with a journalist that if you a journalist asks you a question and you spend five minutes explaining the nuance and intricacies and error bars, uh, that the journalist is going to take the juiciest quote that you said and put that in the article um, and will sometimes, if they're malicious, take your words out of context. If this has been true for two or three generations, why haven't we recognized this reality as a profession and taken steps to address it? Uh, why aren't we training our graduate students to be able to speak to journalists competently and confidently uh, with well-prepared sound bites that reflect well the meaning and intention of their work? Mm. Um, we can't, as scientists, we can't just sit back and do nothing and say, oh, those darn journalists are making us look bad again. Mm. I just shrugged. If you're just listening to the audio, yeah. I just, I just, you know, <laughs> put out my arms in a very dramatic fashion. Yeah, I, I wonder if part of this, because um, you're, it, it feels like you're, you have like a an anger almost directed at the at the educational institutional system, which has has let down science itself by not training these students properly. And as a science communicator, as we both are, we've both also felt and are keenly aware of there is a peculiar relationship that academic science has with the science communicator. Mm -hmm. And you can go all the way back to, you know, someone like Carl Sagan, who just could not get a tenured job when he was at Harvard, I think it was, because he was kind of lampooned a little bit for all of the popular science communication. Yeah. He, well, he, of course, he eventually did get a tenured job at Cornell, but still a pretty good gig. Yeah. <laughs> but, so he ended he ended on his feet. But I, I think it's true that a lot of people if you are engaged in science communication, they'll kind of say, well, that's, you're not a real scientist or you're, you know, you're uh, feeding off the other people's work or something. It, it's like derivative somehow, but it is obviously incredibly central. So is, do you think when it, yeah, do you, do you feel the same way that there is a unhealthy relationship between institutional science and science communicated? Oh yes, absolutely. I, um, I point out in the book how, and this is where some of my personal experiences the thread through the book, um, as I started to engage more with science communication and outreach, when I started that inflection point in my career and just doing it more, it was super fun. I was having a great time. Still am. The faculty would stop me in the hallway and say, you need to knock this off. You're never going to get tenure. You're mm -hmm. never going to be up for professor position if you keep doing this you're you're too visible you're too public you just need to write papers and apply for grants like keep your head down yeah, yeah. don't keep make your any head noise down um 
my retort to them now is my chances of getting tenure were essentially zero anyway. So I might as well have been doing something I enjoyed. I don't think uh, that's true. But... <laughs> because that's that's another dysfunction that uh, is sowing the seeds of mistrust, which is the vast majority of scientists that we are training um, that get PhDs do not end up in research positions that's in true. academia. Mm -hmm. And those people do not necessarily have positive vibes about science. And that is going to come back to bite us. Um, but when it comes to science communication, uh, it is looked down upon. Uh, you can go back even further than Sagan. You can go all the way back to Michael Faraday in the early 1800s, who delivered these series of fantastic Christmas lectures and was looked down upon because he wasn't a real scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find contemporary commentary uh, making fun of him because he wasn't a real scientist. And this is playing with fire the the disincentivization of science communication means that we are leaving science communication in the hands of journalists in the hands of youtubers in the hands of social media influencers in the hands of your crazy aunt or uncle at the dinner table who just read something and decides to speak about that topic and is able to convince their family members those people have a role and a voice in science communication for sure, but where are the scientists? Mm. People feel disconnected, disassociated from scientists. They think scientists are like alien creatures who, who just like do studies that usually contradict themselves and don't connect to the real human condition. Um, science isn't personable. It's not relatable. People don't understand what motivates a scientist. People don't know what drives. Why do we get out of bed in the morning? It's certainly not the money. Mm. Uh, it's a passion <laughs> for, for philosophy, for trying to understand the world we live in. People don't understand the scientific methodology. They don't understand how we arrive at our conclusions as scientists. They don't uh, understand the process of consensus building and argumentation. Um, they don't because they're not exposed to actual scientists. And this is perhaps the most dangerous thing we do as scientists, which is disincentivize science communication because we are building brick by brick a wall between us and the public. And we're leaving it to other people to take our voices from us and use it for their own purposes. There are many lovely journalists out there. I've worked with plenty of journalists, producers, editors, directors, you know, the whole thing. There are many, many lovely, lovely people. There are also some not so lovely people. Mm. And we're, we're letting them take our voices from us. To me, it is, it's, it's so insane. I can barely wrap my head around about how irrational and damaging it is long term. Yeah. A lot, a lot to unpack there. I mean... First, in terms of uh, what you said, I think part of what you said was actually what inspired me to do science communication. And as I felt, there was a voice missing, voices missing in social media space, YouTube space in particular, of research scientists talking about their research, talking about what it's like to be a researcher, and then giving their own insights into how the scientific process happens mm -hmm. in reflection of other discoveries. And so that's something I've try to do on my channel you do a um, fantastic job thank by you the way. and there is a kind of a growth it's interesting i think when i started that there was very few scientists that were both full-time scientists if you like you know actually practicing in a research institute or a professor or something and then also at the same time doing youtube or mm -hmm. TikTok or whatever it is and that that actually seems to be growing yes. so that's kind of interesting yes. as a trend and yet at the same time the distrust in science probably has been declining so that maybe that's an interesting point just to stop on there for a moment like what there seems to be a, a an oxymoron there like why why is it that we have more scientists see it, maybe that's fa a false perception but it seems like there are more scientists talking about their science on the social media and twitter and things like this as well yeah. but why is it that trust is still not rising despite that oh that's it that's an excellent question there are i believe uh time lag effects that are in play if we had started seriously engaging in science communication like in the 90s and early 2000s uh beyond climate change 
and actually engaging one to one personally, you know, scientists to people and really is supporting this institutionally, I believe we'd be in a different space in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, the growth of science communication, I don't want to paint too much of a negative picture, uh, has been very encouraging. There's especially a lot of junior faculty, postdocs, grad students who are uh, dragging senior faculty, uh, <laughs> kicking and screaming through these kinds of necessary reforms, which is very encouraging. It will take time for for us to see the benefits of this kind of action, and we're we're not going to see it yet. It's I think it's going to hurt for a while, and it might even get worse before it starts to get better. There is also, I mean, one thing I try to be cognizant about and thoughtful about as a scientist is it is. Uh, science, and I think maybe this is why scientists, the academic, you know, the institutional side of scientists have a difficult relationship with science communicators. Perhaps this explains part of it is there can be a seduction to do science communication because there's a certain, you know, not celebrity necessarily, I'd mm. call it, but you certainly, you know, it's not like I get mobbed in the street or anything <laughs> like that. And I don't think it's probably true for you either. But people do recognize you sometimes yeah. and it it you know it's kind of uh nice to have all these people sometimes you get nice letters written to you and things like yeah. this and it's it's wonderful you there is a seduction to that and i try to very hard to resist it because i think it can be quite damaging potentially when your ego takes over and yes. you almost develop a cult of of, of me a cult yeah. of trying to and, and i think there have been cases on youtube and other places where scientists have been a little bit guilty of falling into that Absolutely. trap. And and then the 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 solution, let's say the solution is let's get more scientists on YouTube. That's the solution. The solution ends up being self defective almost. It it becomes part of the problem because then you have people who you know, they're an expert in let's say quantum physics, but then they get so emboldened by that expertise that they feel that they can weigh yep. judgment on any topic yep. in science. Yep. And they probably do have a better opinion than most people, but they still should really defer to an expert in many of these very complicated subjects. Um, and it's, I think that, you know, traditional media, I've often felt plays into that. I've often feel like both the public and if you're on like CNN or something being interviewed, they'll ask you, what do you think about this latest geology result or something? And I'm like, I'd say, I'm not a geologist. I don't know. Get a geologist on it. Why are you asking me? But there is an expectation that we're experts in everything. Oh, absolutely. And some people yeah. are seduced by that and fall to it, and it does damage. So maybe we can look at the other side of the coin. Like, do you, uh, what is the, is there examples of damage happening in your opinion? You don't have to give names or anything, yeah. but do you think that oh, this is. Oh, we can. Is... We can totally give names. Let's, let's, let's spill the tea here. David, well, I'm, I'm curious about the, about the, the statistical effects really like how is, is this um is this solution in fact self-defeating that you're proposing i know you're not specifically proposing social media as the solution but if uh, you went that yeah, way social media is a solution because mm -hmm. uh i still believe as a species we're figuring out social media and we haven't exactly figured out how to integrate it into normal functioning human existence you know give us a couple generations we might crack it but that aside Social media, one of the great things about it is that it there are no barriers. It is direct one-to-one -one or one-to-many communication. There are no gatekeepers. There are no editors or journalists. It's just you as a scientist speaking to an audience. And I do believe that is the antidote. Because you're absolutely right. It is seductive. It's nice to be recognized on the street to a certain level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not so nice to get creepy letters in the mail. Um, it's not so nice to get pictures sent to you on social media from quote fans uh there 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 are some dark sides to celebrity <laughs> yeah. uh, but there are lots of nice parts you know there's lots of heartwarming really encouraging things um and i and i hear you about that kind of seduction i would say that even if you were to take out social media uh or a, any media there are some scientists who might be seduced by believing that they can speak on any subject and start writing papers or books about those subjects or giving talks about those subjects. Um, those kinds of personalities are always going to exist and always be with us. They just find a different outlet in media. If you took the media stuff away, they would still find ways to be, to be jerks. Um, <laughs> 
And I do believe the antidote is more voices. One, because there are only so many human beings mm -hmm. with so much time on their hand available to consume so much media. So if you don't want some people who are seduced by the dark side of science communication, there is a tendency, there is a bias to put more and more eyeballs on that because producers start to trust you, directors start to trust you, bookers start to trust you. We'll just go, we'll, oh, they, they're smart and they're good on camera. You, mm. you ask them. Um, the more voices there are present, the more options there are for those producers and directors and journalists to, to reach out to because they, they see more people. And the more scientists who are on social media communicating with the public, the more they can talk about, oh, this person, yeah, they're smart in that field, but they're not so smart in this field. I'm actually an expert in that field and they're wrong because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, how else are we going to combat that? You know, we can't just stop them from being on the media. We can't stop them from spouting nonsense. The only antidote, I believe, is more voices in the room. It won't solve it, won't fix it, but um, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I think the democratization of science communicators, it's probably its probably a stupid thing for us to say as someone who, who both trying to build <laughs> little science communication yeah, yeah. empires, but it is the antidote because, um, yeah, there are so there are so many times I've seen uh, scientists embarrass themselves mm -hmm. talking about something they don't know anything about and causing so much damage yeah. subsequently. And then then there are you know sometimes I discover on Twitter someone who's like the world expert in um, sharks or something. And you're like excellent. Like if I have you know that's exactly. now there's there's someone I know who I have a question in that very niche domain. But if we have those people in every single domain, there's always that we can just say talk. Talk, talk, talk to that, to that person, person over there because yeah. they do that day in, day out. Yeah, I, I agree. You want the dung beetle expert? There they are. <laughs> They've got a profile on social media uh, and they're rocking it. And so when you need to talk about the fate of dung beetles, there's your person. <laughs> There is dung beetle expert out yeah. there. So it's funny to think that there must be a dung beetle expert somewhere. <laughs> so uh, let's come back to something a bit more familiar, uh, away from dung beetles and sharks and things like this, and talk about COVID-19, yeah. very political subject. But uh, you're right that it, that obviously in, triggered or inspired your book, yeah. Rescuing Science, because you were, you were writing it during that time. And we all saw what happened. It, there was an enormous divide in the in the country mm -hmm. about how people treated and trusted what scientists were saying especially the cdc yes. anthony fauci so if we rewind the clock can we can we dissect it and see what went wrong why why because that's whatever you think about you know who was right or who was wrong the outcome of of this breakdown of trust was clearly negative so how could we have what could we have done differently yeah. to have avoided this breakdown that's a tough one for sure. Uh, research surveys showed over the course of the pandemic from 2019 to 2023, we lost the trust. Science as an institution lost the trust of roughly one in six Americans. So we lost one sixth of Americans Huge. over the course of the pandemic. That is, it, it may be impossible to recover from that. Mm. I hope it is possible, but I don't know. Uh, that was huge. And of course, there are multiple lines and multiple threads to this. One is I, I don't envy someone like Fauci. I don't know if I would have done a better job than him in the moment. It was a complex, evolving, difficult situation. I don't want to sit here and be sanctimonious and pretend that I would have done <laughs> yeah. a better job. Like, I don't know. Yeah. But looking back, it is, we can point to some mistakes. And I think the fundamental mistake that public health experts made was when they would go beyond the basis of the evidence and start making recommendations, policy recommendations. Remember, policies affect human beings. Human beings are going to have an opinion on mm -hmm. policy recommendations or mandates. Uh, so yeah, and their opinion is valid because it affects their lives and how they, they, they operate in their life. They're allowed to have this opinion. So we have to be extremely cautious as scientists when we cross over from discussing the evidence, discussing what is happening, offering projections based on simulations and models uh, and crossing over into actual recommendations. So this is a very, very tricky space to be in as a scientist because 
as we know in science, our, our, we change our minds all mm -hmm. the time. That's, that's science's superpower, is that all our beliefs are provisional. All, all our beliefs are subject to revision. All you need is new evidence or even a new way of thinking, a new paradigm to look at the same old evidence. We change our mind constantly. Most people don't look at science that way. They want science to be a source of authority and verification and certainty. And when we cross over to giving people authority, verification, and certainty, we run into trouble. The first example when it comes to the pandemic, one was everyone knew that China, the Chinese government was lying about their numbers, about how many people were sick and how many people were dying, the origins. Everyone knew the Chinese government was lying, but no one was taking them to task. Mm. So it set up the expectation that governments and health officials can lie about the pandemic. Even So even if you are a public health official, you are a government agency, and you are telling the truth using the best available data, people can point to other examples, say, well, you let the Chinese government lie, and we all know they're lying. Um, because they say it's no big deal, but they lock down a country of over a billion people. So obviously it's larger than what they are saying it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so it set up the conditions. Uh, the next was the masks. Of Initially, the recommendation was not to wear a mask, and then it was to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. That set up the condition that maybe our public health officials don't know what they're doing. The next thing that I distinctly remember, do you remember um, Bend the Curve? This was the slogan behind the uh, the lockdowns saying, listen, this virus is out of control. Yeah, We don't know how to stop it. We're trying to treat people. Um, people are going to die. It's a pandemic. It's like, a, it's like an earthquake. It's like a hurricane. Like this is just an, it's a natural disaster. What we, but what we can avoid are the unnecessary deaths where people are stacked up in hospital hallways and mm -hmm. not getting the treatment, or you have a heart attack and there are no beds for you because it's full of COVID patients. So we need to bend the curve so that these deaths still happen, but happen over a longer span of time. And so we can avoid some unnecessary deaths. Yeah. At some point, right before the summer of 2020, bend the curve turned into stop the spread. And you can watch, you can look at all the, the transition and all the news reports, the public health officials, mm. even like social media from scientists turned into stop the spread. Bend the curve was based on a solid epi epidemiological evidence. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, if you take these basic measures, you can slow down the rate of growth of, of infection. And so we don't have as many unnecessary deaths. Stop the spread was beyond what we had evidence for. It was beyond the basis of evidence. We didn't know if lockdowns would actually get rid of the virus. And it turns out it didn't. Mm. Even states, counties, districts, whatever, who did full lockdowns, everyone got COVID anyway, you know, to first order, like everyone in the country got COVID. Um, it and didn't... that led to more mistrust, I guess, because then people were like, I was supposed to not get sick. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then the next mistake we made was with the vaccines. The evidence, we had solid evidence. I got, you know, I got the vaccine, my family got the vaccines. Um, in the boosters and all that, the evidence was clear. If you take this vaccine, your personal risk of, of dying from COVID is extremely low. This will likely save your life and save your grandparents' lives. Um, but the messaging around that turned into, if enough people get the vaccine, we'll have herd immunity and we won't have COVID-19 anymore. Mm -hmm. We'll be done, We're done with masks done with disruptions to our lives, uh, it'll be gone. And then you get into January or February of 2021, when everyone's getting the vaccine and all of a sudden we're talking about breakthrough infections. Mm -hmm. And then we get Omicron later. And we're like, wait a minute, we got the, I thought the vaccine was supposed to make all of this suffering go away. And it did because we weren't dying as much, but the virus was still with us. Because the statement about if enough people get the vaccine, the virus will go away was beyond the basis of evidence. We didn't have the certainty we needed. It was speculation. It was speculation. Yeah. There were some models that you know, projected that outcome. There were a lot of models that did not project that outcome. And so what I believe happened during the pandemic in parallel with the whole politicization 
was scientists were going beyond the basis of the evidence and not speaking with the required level of uncertainty. And I think this is a temptation. You, you talked about seduction, seduction of the media. The media, policymakers, your grandma, they want certainty. Our lives are chaotic and messy and unpredictable. Scientists, like, we're magicians. We're able to predict the future. We're able to create miracles. We can, uh, we made a vaccine that did save our lives. Mm. Um, that's amazing. And there's a temptation to speak with certainty when there is no certainty. And so I think scientists, we need to train ourselves when working with the media, when working with politicians, when working with grandma and grandpa to say, I don't know. Here's a vaccine. Here's all the evidence that it will lower your risk of dying. Well, will we make it, will, will it make the disease go away? Will we still have to wear masks and isolate? The correct answer to that is, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, we need, you know, we should, we should isolate. We should socially distance. We should wear masks uh, because it will, we, we believe it will lower the infection rate. And so not as many people will die. Will make the disease go away? The correct answer is, I don't know. And we need to be brave enough to say, to look you know, a million people in the eye and say, I don't know. I don't have that answer for you. And you know what? In many cases, in complex, fluid, dynamical, changing systems, we may not ever have the answer. Mm. We may never know. Science is a very powerful tool, extremely powerful and beautiful tool for exploring the world around us. It doesn't always give answers, and it doesn't always give answers very quickly. In fact, I, it rarely gives answers quickly. I think one thing that's different with a public health situation to a typical, let's say, an astronomy discovery <laughs> is that you don't really require buy-in from everybody, right? If I if I announce an exomoon, um, <laughs> I would hope that people would believe me, but it's not. It doesn't actually really affect society that much, whether yes. everyone yes. believes me or not. Whereas uh, there was a, a a real need for total buy-in yeah. for if you want to get herd immunity or you want to reach this critical threshold of uh, vaccination. You required everybody to be on board of it, and that, and then that led to kind of very, at least it felt at the time, kind of monolithic messaging that we heard from, you know, the the White House and the CDC. But we, unlike a typical scientific discovery, where you know there'll be the press release and then it will get reported somewhere else, and then maybe and it'll be picked up in a few newspapers, and there'll be a few quotes from scientists who say, actually, I disagree with this. Um, I don't think this is right. Yeah. And I always kind of enjoy that when you hear the other side. Yes. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm persuaded that it's wrong, but it's nice to hear some balance. It's real. There was very little space. It mm -hmm. felt like there, there was no patience for the usual Ambiguity. kind of scientific yeah. discourse that happens with a discovery. And I guess it's obvious why that is, because you had to have total buy-in. But if maybe we underestimated the the smartness, the intelligence of the public, because yeah. I think they kind of saw through this a little bit yeah. oh, and, it, yeah. and, it, and it aggravated the public and sowed these seeds of, of discourse. Yeah. And then if there was no scientist to turn to for, for a counterweight, who do you turn to for counterweight? Yeah. It ends up being podcasters. It ends Anyone. up being, yep. yeah, just whoever's Any, trending a on loud Twitter. Voice. Right. Exactly, exactly. We set up our own seeds. We, we created the conditions where people lost trust in science. And it, that's it. That's a great example. The joke I like to make. So uh, I'm a cosmologist. For those of you who don't know, there's a currently a debate right now about the present day value uh, or the value of the present day expansion rate of the universe. Um, different measures disagree to a few sigma. Wendy um, Friedman has been on the podcast. Okay, Check out that fantastic. previous episode to hear Perfect. about that. Listen yeah. to Wendy Friedman um, talk about it. Imagine if there was some multi-trillion dollar policy de decision that affected hundreds of millions of people that rested on our knowledge of the Hubble constant, the present day expansion rate of the universe. Would cosmology as a field be able to handle that? And what would we tell the public? Would we be able to confidently say to the public, well, the truth is we don't know. They're, they're, we, we, we have two different values um, that disagree with each other to this level of precision. And 
you know, we're going to need another decade to sort it out. We actually don't know. Would we have the confidence in ourselves to say that? Or would we give them the average? Mm -hmm. Or would one side of the camp uh, that believes in like the lower value, would they, would they, would we hold conferences and talk to each other and browbeat our colleagues to say, well, I know you disagree, but you need to be quiet right now because, you know, public <laughs> health is on the line. And oh, my gosh, if, if we tell them that H naught is anything other than 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec, you know, there's going to be mayhem and, you know, they're going to vote the Republicans into office <laughs> and like you need to do this. Like, I don't know if, if cosmology would be able to handle that. Uh, so I don't envy. Would not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, I think you hit the nail on the head that when we present faux certainty, overconfidence, and then we get it wrong, which we did several times in the pandemic. The next time we go to the public and say, well, now you can believe us. And they said, well, you've been wrong before. Mm -hmm. I think the the response to this, because then scientists are like, oh, my gosh, like, what can we do? Um, the answer is maybe we don't do anything. Maybe our role as scientists is a voice and a part in the policymaking process but maybe we leave the decision making up to others and where we can speak our minds and our hearts and our data and our evidence. But the actual process of making political decisions is difficult and often ugly, involves dimensions and factors that are well beyond our expertise as scientists. And maybe that's okay. Maybe we can sit here and say, this is what we think the best outcome is, and this is what I think you should do. And then the public, through the political machinations, you know, arrives at a different conclusion. Okay. Hmm. Like, okay. That's that's their decision. That's our decision. Um, people are going to make decisions that we personally as scientists disagree with. And we have to be okay with that. I mean, it's certainly happening with climate change, right? That's absolutely. absolutely I mean, for like decades, we've had people Although, screaming yeah. about that topic in the scientific community. And there's, there's not been anywhere near the reaction that I think many climate scientists would have hoped for. And, and to their credit, I have seen um, a massive shift in how climate scientists approach the public because this was a hot button issue in the 90s and mm -hmm. early 2000s. You know, we had Al Gore and Inconvenient Truth. And again, we got into trouble when we started stepping outside of the basis of evidence. When we would make projections, confident projections, you know what, over the next decade, you know, the earth is just gonna get warmer and warmer and warmer and it will lead to all these disasters. And then you have something like in the like 2004 to eight, you know, somewhere in that ballpark, I'm not remembering the exact years, where the earth wasn't getting warmer year to year. There was mm -hmm. this pause mm -hmm. in the increase in temperatures. We didn't predict that. We didn't see it coming. Now we understand where it came from. The ocean was, was sinking some carbon in, in unexpected ways. But that was so easy for people to say, well, you're wrong. Mm. You're wrong. Therefore, all climate modeling is wrong. Therefore, yeah. all climate yeah. modeling is yeah. wrong. Why should, and, but that's a valid question. Yeah. If you were wrong about that, why should we believe you now? Why mm. should we believe you now? Um, how do you know you're right now? What if there's something else you didn't think of? In science, this is totally normal. Like, oh, we forgot this. We, we, we just discovered this new second order effect that actually has larger magnitude than we previously thought. And now we account for it in our models and we've improved our knowledge. Yay, that's how we get like grants and promotions and tenure. Um, that is not what we project to the public. That process is not... we. We project to the public answers and results and mm. certainty and like, yeah, it's going to get warmer. So now climate scientists, since that event I've seen, have really changed how they approach messaging. Instead of relying on forecasts and models, which, you know, models are models. Yeah. Uh, what's the saying? Like all of them are wrong. Some of them are useful. Yeah. Um, 
we actually don't know what the climate will look like in 20 years. If you look at the IPCC projections, they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like warmer generally, but we actually don't know what those effects will be 20 years, 40 years from now. So instead of relying on models, we can instead ground ourselves in the evidence and point to what we do know and speak personally to people say, hey, you know what? Winters in the Northeast are milder than they used to be. This isn't a figment of your imagination. We know what causes this. Hey, uh, there are more wildfires out West than there used to be. This isn't, you're just, you're not just seeing things. This is real mm -hmm. and we know what causes it. That kind of personal messaging that relies on the data, that relies on what we as scientists really know where we can firmly say with a great degree of confidence and then speak to people's personal lives and experiences has caused a shift. I almost said sea change, which would be kind of funny in the context of climate change, um, <laughs> has caused a shift in people's outlooks. More and more people believe in anthropogenic global warming than they did 20 years ago. Uh, and I believe it's because of messaging exactly like that. And just experience, I guess, of just, just living in a, in a warming world. But I guess uh, in that case, um, it's maybe it's maybe not enough to say the world is warmer now than it was in the past because some you know there were some folks who were like oh, great like I yep. I don't like the the cold winters. Yeah, in the yeah. I mean is, I'm not exactly complaining uh, yeah. about the milder winters <laughs> right. in the Northeast. Um, so it, it's kind of not enough because you have to you do have to connect it to uh, the future. To I mean the, the whole. I feel like the whole superpower humanity has as a species is that we can think ahead into the future <laughs> in a way that other animals just don't really have the ability to, to think far ahead into the future and plan actions ahead. Yeah. It feels like we, you know, modern society is somehow losing that ability, but that seems to be a unique difference of us. But is, the, is there not a path to talking about the future, but in a probabilistic way? Or there do you think uncertainty is. is just too it's too complicated or too alien of a topic for, the, for them to digest. No, I think I have an uncommon amount of faith in the intelligence of the quote average person or the non-scientist. Mm -hmm. In my work as a science communicator, I have encountered so many people of all kinds from fellow scientists to people who tell me to my face that gravity does not exist. Mm -hmm. um, the broad middle of people are relatively, we'll say, ignorant about science because they just don't know about it. The same way I'm relatively ignorant mm -hmm. about how an internal combustion engine works. Yes, I know the Carnot cycle and thermodynamics <laughs> and combustion and all that, but the actual mechanics of an engine I'm largely ignorant of. Uh, but those people are also very curious and have their curiosity sparked very easily and want to learn more when they are spoken to as equals. They do not want to be taught. We all remember being in school. Mm. And now that we're adults, we don't like being taught anymore. We like being shared with. We like being treated as equals. We do not like being lectured to. Um, when they are spoken to as equals, when they are valued, when there is empathy and respect, people respond and want to know what you have to say because they are genuinely curious. And absolutely, what do we do about climate change? That's a, that's a trillion dollar question, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, there is no one answer to that. We don't know exactly. And the r answers range from a uh, complete shutdown of modern society. That will solve it. Mm -hmm. Also harm a lot of people. Kill all humans would do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, all the way to doing absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. which will, um, you know, harm a lot of people, uh, but is also a response. And it's a response we could choose as society. Um, scientists are not in the driver's seat. And I don't think we want scientists in the driver's seat. Uh, we've developed complex systems for decision making that are messy and complex and, and sometimes horrible, but they are mechanisms, our political process. Uh, we don't always arrive at optimal solutions. We don't always know what the optimal solutions are, and we can't as scientists pretend to know what the optimal solutions are, mm. especially when it impacts, directly impacts people's lives. And so I think our role here as scientists isn't to prescribe, we're not doctors. 
I mean, we're we're PhDs, <laughs> but we're not we're not, we're not MDs. <laughs> yeah. um, isn't to prescribe an antidote or prescribe a solution. We can talk about the various aspects. We can run our models with a certain degree of confidence, and we can speak with that uncertainty. We can say, "I don't know," or "Here's the range of outcomes." Here you go, society. You know. Thank you for asking us for our input. We want a seat at a table at the table. We want a voice in this process, but we understand that there are many dimensions, many factors that go into decisions like what do we do about climate change? Yeah. Um, and that's that is reality. And the more we acknowledge how the world actually works, uh, the better. Yeah, I tend to think of it a lot like an insurance policy. Like you mm -hmm. can't predict that a hurricane will destroy your house yeah. with absolute certainty. There is a certain chance of it happening, but even actually quantifying the exact probability is very, very difficult. Yeah. You just have a sense that um, this area is a higher, doing that, you know, living here will make it a higher probability, living down here will make it a lower yeah. probability. That's all you really have a sense of. And so if you think that's something you're worried about, then you would invest money to protect yourself yeah. against that outcome. And that's certainly the way I think about climate change, just insurance policy against a future outcome where that insurance policy is being spent on mitigation, essentially. Yeah. And um, oh, yeah. I think that's, a, you know, it's like a game theory way of looking at it. So. Um, look, let's change gears a bit. Let's let's talk about academia. Uh, people dying in the, yeah. in the planet, <laughs> yeah, getting hot. Yeah. Something a bit more, <laughs> it's not going to be that up, up, uplifting, but something a bit more positive. Um, let's talk about academia because, um, yeah, we're in the world of academia here at Columbia University. And it has to be said that there is not only a, a loss of trust or a decay in trust in science, but also increasing criticism of academia more generally, of which science is usually institutionally a part of and in particular there's a you know a growing voice that says you know ac academia it's been happening for a long time but academia is liberal has a liberal bias and there's even now you know right-wing um, foundations which are trying to set up you know universities specifically to try and teach almost a right-wing politicized sized version as a counterbalance in their mm -hmm. view to the left-wing politicized traditional university, which I'm sure Columbia would probably fall into that bracket. And so there's, that's, that's a broader canvas in which this this scientific decay is, or trust in science is happening. And so my question to you is, to what extent do you think that this uh, loss in trust in science is the spearhead of the um, political criticism of, of academia more broadly versus a completely separate phenomenon? Like how, how are these related to each these other? These are deeply intertwined and we see these in the surveys. Uh, the segment of the population that has the most trust in science, that believes that scientists work in the public's best interests, that believe that uh, science is a net benefit for society, the segment of the population that wants to send their kids that believe it's a viable career path for their kids to become scientists is a white, middle and upper class, college educated uh, Democrats. Mm -hmm. Far and away blows every other segment of the population out of the water in terms of overall trust in science which is a very, very dangerous position for science to be in. The more that science as an institution or academic science, fundamental research science, there's plenty of fundamental research that happens outside of academia, like you think of uh, the Department of Energy lab system, mm. which are much more conservative and Republican leaning than academic institutions. And a lot of fundamental research happens in those labs. Uh, but when we just look at, but that's not the image most people have of mm. fundamental research. They think it's happening in academia. They're associating those scientists with Democrats, with liberals, with upper to middle class, you know, elite in, in our country. And they are responding appropriately when they are putting science in the the blue bucket they are going to want to by not, association just, by association yeah. whether it's real or imagined um by association this is a very very dangerous place to be in because it means that only when the blue team is in charge do we get funding for science mm. and guess what the blue team is not in charge all the time as we are seeing play out 
you know, just this past month with reduced funding for science across the board because the blue team is not in charge of Congress right mm. now. Yeah, NASA had fairly sizable cuts recently. Yes, and, yeah. NASA, NSF, DOE, yeah. uh, some segments of Department of Energy got increased, the rest got slashed. Um, it's rough. It's rough. This is not the position we want to be in. My pipe dream is that no matter who's in charge, science comes out as a winner. That so it's apolitical. Apolitical. Um, what that means is that we have to deliberately reach out as scientists to communities, to segments of the population that currently have the lowest trust in science. And that is, uh, there are two general categories of groups of people in the United States that do not trust science. One is uh, whites who do not have a college education who are leaning Republican or vote Republican. So you think of like uh, a Trump voter. Mm -hmm. Trump voter is highly unlikely to trust science. Mm. The other segment of the population are essentially any minority group. Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, as a group, do not trust science. This is, to me personally, a very scary, very precarious position to be in, where only one group in the United States really, really, really is a fan of science. And this is fairly n new, right? This isn't a something, if you look back in history, I feel like this has not always been the case. And in fact, there are a lot of, and, and maybe just to push back a little bit, maybe it's not completely universal, because I think there are many uh, Republicans who are huge fans of, say, you know, what SpaceX are doing right. and the you know, the growing space industry and the potential for space exploration. And so, yeah, I think um, it's 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 maybe not a it's not necessarily science as a whole, but Absolutely. but yeah. maybe the I don't know what you call it, like mainstream science, certain um, yep. institutionalized parts of science rather than maybe the privatized aspects of science. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, when it comes to blacks, Hispanics and Native Americans, they've essentially never trusted science because guess what? They've been screwed over by science uh, frequently and often throughout history. So there's a lot of work we need to do there to repair those kinds of relationships. Uh, when it comes to the Republican Democrat split, that this is relatively new. It used to be relatively apolitical or each each um, party would robustly support science funding. Uh, this has deteriorated starting in the 90s, going into 2000s. And you're right, it's not monolithic. Like even during the Trump presidency, almost all areas of fundamental research uh, experienced lower funding, but some areas of research actually got increased funding. Mm -hmm. um, so it is not a monolithic thing. But when it comes down to it, when you ask the broad question, when you're, say, a lawmaker in Congress and you're deciding on appropriations of how much money NSF gets and NASA gets, you look at your constituency and you take the general mood. You don't necessarily drill down area by area by area, field by field by field. You say, well, in general, my constituents uh, don't like science and don't see a benefit to science, so why should we keep paying for it? But isn't that poor just to hit this a little bit harder? Is is my maybe it's just a feeling, but I feel yeah. like this is feelings are good. <laughs> it's directed at institutional government university based science. It's not directed at, say, IBM's research program yeah. or, you know, some startup company that's genetic, developing genetic mm -hmm. testing mm -hmm. or an, an NVIDIA's AI chips that are, that are doing research in that field. It's yeah. the private world. Does, I don't think is getting any kind of this politicization of they're doing fundamental research or not maybe fundamental, but they're doing lots of research in, in, in technology and uh, science as well. So it does feel like it's it's uh, specific to anything that's fed off the channel of, you know, the the government essentially in some yes, way. Yes. Yeah. Um, although I will say there is some politicization in the opposite direction, the unexpected direction, like resistance to genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. This kind of research is largely done by private entities and resistance to it comes largely from Democrats or liberal leaning people. So there is you can you can look at individual fields, uh, even within privately funded or industrial science and, and find some political splits. But you're exactly you're 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 exactly right, which is the 
kind of research that is funded by the government, what we like to call fundamental research, like your research, my research, mm. the basic stuff that doesn't necessarily lead to an immediate technological benefit, but changes how we look at the world. Um, that kind of research is almost entirely publicly funded mm -hmm. and has become very highly politicized, where largely Democrats, wealthy Democrats, college educated Democrats support it. And if you're not fit in that bucket, then you you largely don't support it. You want to see less and less funding for it. And we need to reach out to Republicans, to rural people, to that. You need, we need to find the segments of the population. I believe this is a challenge that scientists have to face if we want to survive and robustly survive for generations to come. We have to find the segments of the population that hate science the most, that distrust science the most, who, whether because they honestly believe it or they're being misled, have distorted views of science. And we need to talk to them. We need to empathize with them. We need to understand why. There's a reason why they don't trust science. We need to address those reasons. We need to change how we approach those people. Uh, because if we continue down the path that we are on, where only Democrats support science, then we're just another political football. And it will spill, spell the end of, of fundamental research. I hear you. I think it, it makes total sense. But maybe uh, a resistance to such a program would be it's, it feels very combat. It, it feels inevitably combative. Like you would, let's say you went on to Truth Social and you said, <laughs> this is the place where I think I could do the most good in terms of talking to an audience who maybe has has lost the greatest. I don't even know if that's true, but just let's say that that was the case. You went on there, but I think you might anticipate if that is the place, if that is the, the you know, the, the snake pit, let's say, mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of bites mm -hmm. and it's going to take a huge amount of, perseverance, willpower, you almost have to be kind of superhuman. Why would a why would a rational human being scientist who's, you know, just struggling to get their grant money. You're a uh, poor country astrophysicist. Uh, <laughs> just trying to get back. Right. They, why? Uh, you're, you're asking a lot of them, I think, to to go into that environment and just be yelled at uh, potentially i mean there'll be people that will listen but we yeah. know what it's like there'll be a lot of people that will give you a hard time as well it, it's it, it feels like a difficult pitch as a solution mm -hmm. to get people on, to get scientists on board with that if i said to my <laughs> students look here's what's happening you're all going uh, to a, a trump rally tomorrow yeah. and we're all gonna talk about so science the, like, all, yay science t-shirts yeah. <laughs> yeah, <they're like> <laughs> they, they i don't think they would be that enthusiastic about it and so <laughs> yeah, is, is is there a practical yes, issue with that yes. solution? Oh, absolutely. So one is that you've had a career in academia. We've we've been bitten by snakes throughout our entire careers. Mm -hmm. That's part of the scientific process is people raising their hands at the end of your conference presentation saying you are wrong this will never work and also i don't like the way you dress like you know <laughs> like we're used to like that kind of antagonism yeah. um uh it can certainly we find it healthy uh to be always challenged in our beliefs and have to defend ourselves it can spill over into toxicity which is a completely different discussion so uh, being afraid of people challenging your views, uh, coming from a scientist, I find that laughable because that is the entire organization. No, not, not of afraid, ex exhausting, I'd say is maybe okay. a more appropriate way to think of it. Like, That's that fair. You're, you're just going to be yelling at someone or be yelled yeah. at for, for, heart, you know, for hours yes. on end is not, a, it's not a necessarily a fear, but just not a particularly nice way to spend an afternoon. Absolutely, absolutely. And I empathize with that. Here's my strategy. Here's how I do it. Like I said, I I encounter all sorts of people, as do you, who have all sorts of opinions and thoughts and who are perfectly willing to tell me I'm wrong. We don't need to think big. We don't need to think Truth Social or Fox News or whatever. We can think small. We can think family. We can think friends. We can think people we interact with on an everyday basis. My standing rule to myself so that I don't exhaust myself or frustrate myself. People tell me all sorts of things 
all the time that fly in the face of what we know from science. Unless they directly ask me a question, I do not offer my opinion because I know the likelihood of me changing their mind is essentially zero. I don't have that superpower. I don't know how to change people's minds. I don't. It feels almost impossible, right? It, yeah. I to, mean, to, ha, have you ever, like, like, it's very hard to change even scientists' minds. Mm -hmm. You know, the joke is like science advances one funeral at a time. We, you know, we hardly even change our own minds, even with mm -hmm. the weight of evidence. Um, changing people's minds is the wrong approach. It's that is not the, my goal in science communication because it's futile, it's pointless. Instead, what I try to develop is positive views about science. If someone comes up to me and says, we never landed on the moon, I am never, I'm going to assume that I'm never going to change that person's mind. But I bet I could talk to them about something that they've never heard of before. I bet I could talk to them about black holes. I bet I could talk to them about supernova or the Big Bang. I bet I could get them excited about science. Mm -hmm. That's my own challenge. Mm -hmm. Not to fight their fight. I'm not going to change their mind. Fine, skip it. If they want to believe that we never landed on the moon, fine. Like, I mean, honestly, who cares? Yeah. What I want is for them to be able to say science is pretty cool and science is worth funding. And we should keep paying for those scientists because they're doing pretty cool, interesting stuff. That is my goal. So I sidestep any direct conflict because I'm not going to change someone's mind. If they ask my opinion, then I'll give it and I'll tell them that I think they're wrong and I'll explain why. But if they're already asking for my opinion, it means they're already primed to mm. receive the information and uh, be and have a willingness to change their mind. In what I try to instead go after is empathy mm. and common ground and understanding so that they walk away from that interaction feeling positive like they just talked to a scientist and they feel pretty good that yeah. is a small victory a small thing that can add up over hundreds of millions of hearts and minds and that is where we draw a basis in support not through conformity not in changing people's minds but in changing people's views yeah and joy and curiosity about science that is my challenge. That seems to a much healthier way. Scientists. Yeah, I said personally, when I do science communication, it's uh, I, I don't really have a conscious um, like purpose or agenda in mind. It's, it's just, just fun. It's just it's like being in love. Like you just have to tell people about yeah, it because exactly. it's something you you can't keep inside of you. And, and talking oh, about yeah. it is something that it, I you tell, have to do. I tell I was. Uh, out to lunch with graduate students. And I said exactly this, like there is a reason you get up in the morning. There is a reason you're doing that. It's, it's certainly not the money you're doing it because you love this. And if you don't love it, you should really question why you're a graduate student mm -hmm. in physics. You love this. That's what people connect and people connect with passion. People connect with love. People connect with seeing the light in your eyes when you just perk up and start talking about something that you love. Oh my gosh, people respond to that. They connect with that on yeah. a deeply human level, a powerful human level mm -hmm. that we do not leverage enough as scientists. People do not change their mind from data or evidence or even headlines. They change their minds and they change their views because they fall in love with you. Yeah. And that's why scientists need to be on social media more. That's why they need to be communicating science more so that people can look at someone and fall in love with that person and with what they're doing. And then cross my fingers. I have no idea if this will work. <laughs> cross my fingers that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, we'll see more robust apolitical funding for science. I want to ask you about Sagan. You you mentioned you had a little chapter in your book about addressing something he wrote in Demon Haunted World, which is uh, you know really held up as kind of a classic book mm -hmm. on a, on a, along a similar lines of thinking about science and society. I want to give you a quote. He said, "He said if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs, and we you know we." sort of bemoaning the lack of trust in scientists but at the same time science is fundamentally the act of being skeptical and we should 
really hope that the public would hold us to to a degree of skepticism yeah. we, we it would actually be kind of tragic if they had absolute faith because then it becomes <laughs> dogma and yeah. a religion at that point rather than the nature of science itself is to is to question so my question to you is what does healthy skepticism look like in the public some people say you yeah, do your own research but we can immediately kind of question no no not, not how, that research no 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> i mean what does that even look like it does does 10 minutes of googling really qualify as research like how what what would be your advice to someone who is not an expert in a topic but um is hearing about something that maybe a scientific claim that unsettles them that they something doesn't feel right about yeah. it how should they approach such claims Ooh, that's a, that's an excellent question and in this quote is very powerful there's a lot of good things that carl sagan says in a demon haunted world i don't take issue with the entire book just some parts of it um that propose that science is the best way to approach all problems and the best way to view the world in all situations. That's mm -hmm. something that uh, known as scientism, which is a, a major component, a major source of distrust in science. But that's that's mm. a separate discussion. Um, when it comes to this about skepticism. Yeah, uh, we're the authority. We're, we are the institution. Mm -hmm. We are the elite. Scientists are the intellectual among the intellectual elite in the world. We're the man. Yeah. Um, people are going to question us and they may come to some very bizarre conclusions from our perspective. And we have to remember that they are distrustful of us because of what we represent, not because of the answers we're delivering, but because of what those answers represent and what we as an institution are a part of. Um, and yeah, people are going to doubt and be skeptical. The degree of skepticism may be, you know, it can be all over the spectrum from light irrationality to to completely off the wall. Mm -hmm. But there and I don't think there's anything we can do to directly address that. I think there's no level of education or information that is going to change people's attitudes if they have formed a seed of doubt about science as an institution, then w there's very little that we can do to addr directly address that. Instead, we have to look at what, what caused that seed in the first place. Was this group marginalized? Did this group suffer because of the recommendations of scientists or because something that scientists did or something that scientists were attached to? Uh, or is it simply guilt by association? We are part of the intellectual elite. We are part of, uh, you know, liberal, wealthy, liberal institutions like universities. And if people view, believe that they are being harmed by these institutions, then they're not going to be fans of anything associated with those institutions, scientists included, even exoplanet researchers. Yeah. So dealing with, say, out of control skepticism is a symptom of a much larger issue. Uh, and the much larger issue is people have lost faith in the institution of science. We don't ask for belief in individual results. We don't even believe our own individual, our own results, because hmm. they'll change tomorrow, next week, in 100 years. So but they believe it's in bad faith. It's not we we have become untrustworthy not because the the results themselves are um, scientifically questionable, but that the intent almost exactly. of scientists is malicious. It's it's yes. in some sense, yeah. And sometimes they're right. Some scientists are malicious. Some scientists are deliberately fraudulent. There have been several high profile cases where top tier researchers have been caught falsifying mm. data. Yeah. Or we can look at the case of Claudine Gay, the former president of Harvard. Yes, mm. it was a politically motivated, vicious attack to try to tear her down. Imagine a world where she didn't plagiarize in her work. Like, what if we as scientists held ourselves to a higher level of accountability? What if we policed ourselves better? 
I do believe, and I argue in the book, that fraud of the broad spectrum of research misconduct is out of control. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have a handle on it. And this gives people the seeds they need. If they don't want to trust science, they can point to examples where scientists have lied. And when we don't do a good job of policing ourselves, it is a case of the bad apples ruin the bunch. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, well, those are just... So, yeah, you know, they're they're awful scientists. They're lying. They're deliberately distorting. You know, they're awful. Yeah, a lot of them still have tenure. And it took 20 years for us to figure out that they were lying. That's not a good look on the honest ones, on the good scientists. Um, we need to do a lot better job combating fraud and research misconduct so that when the accusations come, we are a more trustworthy institution and we can say, yes, Scientific research misconduct is very bad. And here are the practices that we have in place to police it and eliminate it. And that uh, when we spot bad researchers, they don't get to call themselves scientists anymore. They're out of a job. They don't they don't have a career anymore. Um, we do not do a good job of mm. policing ourselves. And that gives people everything they need to, to not have faith in science. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking this topic on, Paul, because I think it actually takes a lot of courage to discuss this because a lot of people don't want to actually get into the into this. And it's it's much easier as you have done in you know in the past and many people do, is to write books on what's, you know, cool and sexy in the in astronomy yeah. or whatever in space right now. But this is a a, a topic which affects us all in yeah. society. And um, it's also I think a conversation and something Absolutely. that you are putting a voice forward and hopefully it is just the start of of a of a two-way conversation as well yes. from the other side of yes. trying to regain that trust so tell us where where can we get the book and where else can we learn more about all the work you're doing uh, thank you again for hosting me uh, both today to give a colloquium here in the department of astronomy and to meet with all the wonderful students and faculty and for hosting me on this show the book is uh, rescuing science restoring trust in an age of doubt it's available everywhere you find books the easiest place is Amazon. Uh, just type in my name or type in Rescuing Science, you'll find it. And you can find out more about me from my website. That's the best avenue. That's pmsutter.com. P as in Paul, M as in Matthew, S-U-T-T-E-R.com. Great. I'll link to those down below in the show I notes as well. It. So thank you very much, Paul. Thank you so much, David. So that was my conversation with Paul Sutter. And if you want to learn more about this topic, this conversation, this dialogue that he's trying to start, then obviously do check out his book, Rescuing Science. I'll put a link down below in the show notes where you can order it right now. It's out today and you can learn more about this and think about it more for yourself, because frankly, this is a topic that more of us do need to be thinking about. So if you like this podcast and you want to support these conversations, this is the moment where I get to tell you how to do that. You can head to the website coolworldslab.com slash support. That's my group's website. That's coolworldslab.com slash support. And in that way, you're actually not just supporting the podcast, which you are, but you're actually also supporting my research team. In fact, that's where all of the money goes to, supports my research team. That means, in effect, I have to let, write less proposals for research grants, which gives me more time to do these kind of podcasts and the, of course, the main channel, YouTube videos as well. So that is the best way to do it. And of course, it's hopefully a unique proposition to you guys because you are funding research directly at Columbia University in astrophysics. How cool, how much more cooler could you want? So please do check that out. Uh, next two weeks, we've got a new guest coming on. That is Professor Lisa Kautzenegger from Cornell University, the director of the Carl Sagan Institute over there. And she too has just finished a new book. It's called Alien Earths. So we're going to get into the meat of that book, discovering how do we measure exoplanet atmospheres? How do we look for life? And how realistic is it that we will get a detection in our lifetime? So if you want to learn more about that, please do stay tuned to this podcast to get more of that. And until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious.